Coming up, another student intern scandal in Missouri. Hillary pilloried over private emails. Now it's Sam Brownback's turn. Going, going, not gone. Why Kansas lawmakers simply can't balance the budget. And going ape at the Kansas City Zoo. Hello and welcome, I'm Nick Haynes, and thanks for joining us this Memorial Day weekend as we once again take you behind the headlines, making news in Kansas City, dissecting those stories this week from the call newspaper, Eric Wesson, from the pitch, Steve Vokrot, from the editorial pages of the Kansas City star, Barbara Shelley, and star reporter, columnist, and blogger, Dave Helling. Will Kansas City voters be deciding a minimum wage at the ballot box this August? The answer this week is absolutely not. Though after hours of debate at City Hall, Mayor James says he vows to work on that this summer through council action. He stopped short of promising the $15 an hour living wage that petitioners had the signatures to place on the ballot. But the mayor says he will support boosting minimum pay in the city to 13 bucks an hour. But why the delay? Is this just a brush off, Eric? I think it's uh, working out some bugs that need to be worked out, and it kind of satisfies the masses right now while they figure out what to do and how to do it. Uh, they have to, the business community, I think, is giving a lot of backlash about it, and it's trying to find a medium ground with the business community and the petitioners and the rest of the community on trying to find a medium point that everybody can get along with. Was there any feeling that if it went on the ballot in August, Dave Helling, it wouldn't have passed? Because also you had this week in a, a full-page ad in the Kansas City edition of the USA Today newspaper from some opponents of this. So there's already a lot of money being spent trying to kill this proposal. Yeah, uh, it, it would be an interesting battle in the summer, and there was no guarantee of passage at $15 an hour, although we should be clear it would be phased in over time. So, but, so they may have sort of relied on what the mayor was uh, pledging to do, because they do have a bit of a time squeeze here. The belief is you have to get something done by August or the state statute kicks in and Kansas City would no longer have complete control over what its minimum wage is. So, but, they keep, but, but they keep saying that, but I thought there was already a law on the books at the state level that said you could not have a, a city have a minimum wage that's higher than the state level, Barbara. Uh-huh, and that is debatable, and I don't think there's any question that this whole thing is going to end up in court. Um, you know, people during the legislative debate said, well, if there is such a law, why are you, why are you passing another? Why are you passing this other thing? So, um, you know, I, I think the lawyers will have their the, say in this. The specific, I read the language in the, in the bill that passed this year in the legislature, and it in essence says, uh, cities can't exceed the state level, um, but whatever level it exists in August is okay if it's not matching. And yeah. so I think the city thinks it can slide in under that new exemption. One That's of the, most, the argument. One of the most compelling yeah. arguments, though, this week in terms of opponents is that, you know, if Kansas City were to do this, then businesses, restaurants, and others will just move over to another city adjacent, adjacent to Kansas City, Missouri, Steve Vokrot. What is the evidence that that would actually happen? Well, it depends on what evidence you're looking at, and there's what I'm finding is that there's a lot of cherry picking going on in this debate on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, there was something pretty convincing that I read in the Washington Post that did sort of a meta analysis of a lot of different studies and found that the effects of minimum wage hikes uh, more on kind of the consequence, you know, the, the doom and gloom side of it may be a bit overstated. Presidential candidate Hillary Clinton is being bashed for using a private email account during her entire time as the nation's Secretary of State. What was she hiding? Was she simply trying to skirt open records? This week, it's disclosed that Sam Brownback has been using a private email account for correspondence during his entire time as Kansas governor. In fact, all communication flows through his private cell phone. The governor insists the practice saves the state money and is less complicated. If that's the case, should he be congratulated rather than pilloried, Barbara? No, he should not be congratulated. I mean, if that's his idea of being fiscally responsible, well, <laughs> I won't go there. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't see a whole lot of difference in the controversy over Hillary's emails and Sam Brownback's private communications. And, um, you know, as you know, Nick, the attorney general of Kansas has looked at the statute and said, well, you know, it does not 
the way I interpret it, violate the Kansas Open Records Law to do this. That means they have to fix the statute, and there's a couple measures to do that, but it's kind of lost so, the commission. So that would be a difference, though, Dave, because in the sense that in this, at the national level, the accusations against Hillary Clinton is that she was breaking uh, rules by not following the protocols about emails, whereas right. in the state of Kansas, as Barbara points out, mm -hmm. there, there wasn't any laws or protocols or rules. Right, and of course, some of this is the result of email technology technology, which is old to all of us, but the statutes don't really catch up in some ways to the ways we communicate now. I, I will say I'm a little less worried than Barb and some others about the existence of private communications channels for elected officials because, frankly, I assume they all have back channels that they use that are not subject to public review. If, if you said tomorrow, hey, Sam Brownback, you, all your emails are public, all he has to do is pick up the phone to talk to David Kensinger or whomever he wants to. So, so uh, you know, I, I think that transparency is important and is a goal, but we should not fool ourselves to thinking changes in the statute would completely open Steve, government. does the public really care about this, though? Uh, I don't know how much the public cares directly. I don't know how many people sitting at home watching this program are considering open records requests, but for <laughs> people sitting around this table, uh, it is a useful tool in news gathering to be able to view communications of the public's business, which in theory should be done in the light of day. Can, can I just mm -hmm. give you an example of why it's important? I, I did an open records request for all the emails around the Republican National Convention uh, 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 effort from Kansas City, and I found an email from Sam Brownback where he pledged $3.3 million from the state of Kansas for the convention. He never mentioned that publicly. It was never debated publicly. It was just off of... So, you know, that's something the public should know. That's why those emails Eric. are important. In the history, and going back to Desi and the Castro, there were some emails yeah. <clears throat> that had taken place with the school district that came to light. So was, there is an interest in what, for the media standpoint, letting the public know on what these email conversations and these paper trails or saying, and now what you've got the sexting going on. So if they're doing that on their cell phones, there's no telling what they're saying in their emails. So that's a that would be a great interest to what was going on in the public eye. Well, and just to raise another example, a pretty recent one, one of the major stories that broke in the Ferguson matter was when right. news outlets got a hold of some of the emails from law enforcement authorities who were conveying um, rather racist attitudes um, in carrying out their work. While we are talking about Hillary, the Democratic candidate for president has announced she will be taking her campaign to Missouri next month. Where is she heading, and what's the attraction of coming to the Show Me State so early in the campaign? I, I don't know. I actually I reached out to the mm -hmm. campaign a couple of days ago, and they have not yet provided details. I think Missouri, somewhere in Missouri, uh, June 23rd is the day, but we don't know for sure. I do think she's making but some effort to sort of... But if you put in an uh, open records but, but, request yeah, for but, her but email, yeah, she yeah. find out yeah. that information. <laughs> this far out, the Hillary Clinton campaign is already organized in the state of Missouri, or at least getting organized, has already hired somebody. That's more than any other candidate okay. on, in, in either party. That suggests that uh, the organization of her campaign is pretty far down the road. It, and and yeah. if you think back, she has great ties to uh, uh, Representative Cleaver, as well, so he might have been his relationship with her and the fam Clinton family might have a lot to do with her starting in Missouri, and maybe they think they can swing Missouri blue for it. But if I had to guess, I'd say she's going to the St. Louis area and maybe mm -hmm. do a fundraiser because yeah. yeah. that's where the money is. Well, for mm -hmm. the second week in a row, I've been ready to pull the trigger on this banner headline: Kansas legislature ends. Unfortunately, for the second week in a row, I've had to remove it at a cost of forty-three thousand dollars a day. Kansas lawmakers meeting in Topeka are already. In overtime. They still can't decide how to fill a $400 million budget hole. And now they've gone home for the Memorial Day weekend with promises to fix the problem next week. There's been lots of late night debates that would balance the state's budget by increasing the Kansas sales tax, hiking cigarette and gas taxes, and temporarily suspending the income tax exemption the state recently passed for more than 330,000 business owners and farmers. That would get lawmakers to the $400 million mark. So why is it so difficult for lawmakers to bite the bullet and vote yes so they can wrap this up, Barbara? <laughs> well, Dave and I both made pilgrimages to Topeka this week on separate days, and neither of us see any way out of this. I mean, they bring up 
proposals in committee and people just sit there like zombies. Um, you know, they just don't want to do anything. So and, we could yeah. be still talking about this in September? Definitely? I think we could be talking about it well into June, but okay, you know, right. the budget is supposed to take place July 1st. And when I asked people down there, well, what are you going to do if you don't have a budget? No one really knew. I was yeah. told yesterday there is some nervousness that uh, if the budget is not locked into place next week, that to sooner rather than later layoff notices will have to go to Kansas employees because the fiscal year starts July 1 and there is some lag time. Very similar to what happens when the federal government shuts mm -hmm. down, by the way. You send out furlough notices. So there is a bit of hurry up involved here uh, for, for state legislators. But Nick, it, it, and Barb is exactly right. It, it, they're nervous about raising one tax, but the bill that they're now considering raises sales, property, income, tobacco, fuel taxes. I mean, it, it, it's, it's the, you know, the, the mother of all tax increase bills. One and a half billion dollars over three years to find enough votes to pass that is going to be extraordinary. Well, if taxes are so unpleasant, what about growing revenues? Lawmakers this week also weighing up a bill to revive the former Woodlands dog and horse racing track in Wyandotte County and bringing hundreds of slot machines to the facility, which closed in 2008. The state would get a big cut off of all of that, meaning millions of dollars to help fill a pesky budget hole. This footage, by the way, from Fun on the Run, a new documentary on the Woodlands running this week on Time Warner Cable Sports Channel. What's the prospect of that happening, Steve? It's a little bit up in the air right now, and even Wyandotte County itself is sending some conflicting messages about does it want the Woodlands to open? Uh, true, there could be some incremental revenue increases for the county, perhaps more for the state, but they're also concerned, you know, if we open this other gambling establishment after we've just opened the Hollywood Casino, are we creating competition for something that we poured in a lot of resources when the gaming was expanded in Kansas a few years ago? But it's only being entertained, though, because there may be money involved for the state, yes? Well, yes, but um, this is one thing with having the legislature in session. You know, only certain people are involved in trying to figure out the budget, and the others of them amble around and come up with things like, let's open the woodlands, or, you know, let's do away with the Kansas Bioscience Authority yes. or whatever. So um, yeah, it would produce some revenue, but I, I just think there's not time to figure it all out, and there's too many angles involved. I don't think it's going to go not anywhere. The key, and it's not the linchpin. Yeah. I mean, it, it isn't yeah. as if you could open the woodlands and suddenly half the problem goes away. Uh -huh. I mean, the problem, Nick, is the, you can't solve this with a half-cent sales tax. You can't solve it with a two-year nickel gas tax. When you're $400 million in the hole, you've got to really get after a broad range of taxes. There is no enthusiasm for that task down in Topeka. The governor is in absentia. Uh, when you put all that together, seeing how they get out alive is going to be difficult. Missouri lawmakers, though, do complete their work. All 197 state senators and House members are now back home in their districts. A fill-in-the-blank question for our news reviewers. After five months in Jefferson City, Eric, lawmakers can pat themselves on the back for blank. <laughs> I have no... Well, at least they got 130 bills passed. Yes, see, now you found something positive. That's a decrease of the 190 that they got passed last year. Okay. Uh, Steve Volkrod. Uh What can they pat themselves on the back for? <laughs> Not much. Uh, you know, and, and, but, to be, but to be honest, they didn't have quite as much work to do as Kansas does. Uh, their situation isn't quite as, uh, as bleak as it was in Kansas. But, you know, just the Ferguson-related bills alone, for all the attention that Missouri got nationally and internationally and how they did so little, uh, to, to, to come up with any kinds of solutions for the issues that plagued Ferguson. Uh, no patting on the back that I can tell. Why, why was that, though? Because we, there was all of the talk. There was like 60-something bills from body cameras. We're going to eliminate grand juries. There has to be a special prosecutor when there's an officer-related uh, shooting. None of those things happened. Well, they, they did, did, the did do a municipal thing. court. Yeah, thing. the municipal yeah. court where a, a um, city cannot gain more than a certain percentage of its revenue from traffic tickets. That was already all a law, but they lowered it. And, you know, if I, that would be... Um, how I would answer your question, yes. Nick. That was their one thing they could pat themselves on the back for, and that's not huge, you know. But I, I think that the biggest gap was being able to uh, educate rural area uh, elected officials that there's a problem. 
And I think that that was the biggest thing was nobody was able to translate that. And it looked like a session against poor people, low income people, and babies. And when you look at all the things that they did, those that was their focus uh, to me, rather than trying when, to. When do you're looking at patting the legislation something. on the back, what can they pat themselves on the back for? Well, I think the session? they may be patting themselves on the back for a $300 million bond issue for some repairs at state facilities that that needed to be done universities. But Nick, I, I didn't see that front page story, though, in the Kansas City Star. It, it was in my story in the okay. newspaper. But anyway, um, <laughs> down low. Um, but I am working on a story this weekend, and Eric touched on it. In Missouri, over the governor's veto, there were a significant new restrictions added to welfare, the TANF program, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. Kansas, as you may know, also went through the same exercise, codifying some regulations that really toughen welfare in that state. There are suggestions talking to national people that Missouri and Kansas are really ground zero, if you will, in a broad-based, state-based effort to fundamentally change the social safety net, not just welfare, but food stamps, Medicaid, mm -hmm. unemployment insurance, job training, all the programs that Washington wants to block grant. Uh, Kansas and Missouri may be a template in some ways for that effort in other states. That's an important story. We, we need to pay attention to that. What happened in Missouri and in Kansas this year may be exportable, is the way one person put it to me, to other states, and may be the battleground in 2016 uh, across the country. And, and Nick, when you look at those those budget cuts and those attacks and those bills, they are geared specifically for low-income people. Uh, in Kansas, you can carry a gun, buy a gun, but you can't buy Doritos or Oreo cookies. That does, just doesn't make any sense in the, how they, they put all that together. Well, the session in Missouri may best be remembered for scandal and tragedy, the death of Missouri State Auditor Tom Schweik from a self-inflicted gunshot wound and the suicide of his longtime aide and the resignation of the, of the Missouri House Speaker over sexually charged texts with an intern. But is the intern scandal over? Apparently not. This week, the Missouri Senate and the University of Central Missouri investigating allegations that sexual harassment led two student interns to abruptly end their assignments in the office of Senator Paul Lavoda, an independence Democrat. Now, it doesn't say the senator himself is a target of the investigation, only that something occurred in his office which is being investigated. But what is the senator's uh, response to the allegations? Uh, he, he said he is not... Uh, privy to what the uh, school may be investigating, uh, that he enjoys the internship program, he's been there for 11 years, he doesn't know the specifics. I will tell you that uh, there are other suggestions that the intern program, broadly speaking, at the state capitol needs some serious oversight and review, not just limited to Paul Lavota's office. That may be part of the story that develops over time. But isn't well. this a much more serious story? Because in the, unlike John Deal's story, which was really two consenting adults uh, texting one another, however m people might have thought this was inappropriate for a speaker of the house. With an intern. With an intern, but she was over the right, age of 18. No question, but she was still uh, an intern. And these were private texts no that question. became public. This is actually laws being broken in, in, in the allegations here. We don't know. I mean, we don't know exactly what the allegations are, so there's no way to say that. But, you know, the university did initiate an investigation and ask the Senate to help them. So, you know, I think the university is signaling that they, it's been reported to them that something wrong went on there, but we don't know the details. Okay. Eric. Jeff said he sits, like Dave said last week, in the middle of the state. It sits there, and they're kind of flying under the radar. It's no telling what's going on there, the people. They're away from Kansas City. They're away from St. Louis. They're kind of in no man's land. So it's no telling what's going on there. And they probably are going to uncover a lot of stuff going on down there, both with Republicans and Democrats. Before heading out of town, Missouri lawmakers pass a measure expanding charter schools in the state. Why is it that only Kansas City and St. Louis even have charter schools? If they're so great at offering choice to families, why not elsewhere? A bill now on the governor's desk would permit charter schools throughout Jackson County, with the exception of the tiny center school district. That law says it only applies to districts with fewer than 3,500 students. So what's wrong with offering the choice to more parents, Barbara? <coughs> Well, I think that charter schools were started in Kansas City and St. Louis because they were having academic performance problems, um, accreditation problems. Um, why are they not statewide? Well, 
you know, they don't work everywhere. Um, you know, the, the thing with charter schools is they take both students and money from other school districts, and that's why Center and a couple other smaller school districts in Jackson County were exempted. Lone Jack and Grain Valley, or Oak Grove, I think. Um, you know, and a lot of the push for charters comes from rural legislators who understand that they won't work in their districts, but they love the pure idea of school choice. And so they looked at Jackson County and St. Louis as a new laboratory for charter schools. Eric. But charter schools aren't performing better than public schools. And in a lot of cases, they're performing worse than public schools. That's the untold story. But it's not, I, I'm not understanding why they would expand it to e let even more dysfunctional schools come on board to miseducate kids. And there's, <laughs> but there's no guarantee, though. There's no guarantee that the governor is going to sign this measure, though. No, I think he's, you know, as a, he always says, Nick, he's going to take a close look at it. But the, the most important way for us to understand the legislative dynamic not just on this issue, this issue, but all issues in Missouri and Kansas is the rural-urban split, mm. and this is another yeah. example of it. The rural lawmaker doesn't want to go home to the pancake breakfast on Saturday and go, by the way, we set up charters in this county to take students away from the high school, the local high school or grade school. That's not popular mm -hmm. in smaller towns. It's easy to vote for that in Kansas City and Missouri. You don't represent them. That dynamic exists in Kansas as well across a broad range of issues, that's what we need to be paying. Some for. issues never go away, while Kansas lawmakers still can't work out the differences over the budget. They did find time to work on a number of other matters this week. One was to bring Uber back. Yes, after vetoes and veto overrides and claims by Uber, they're finished with Kansas. What on earth happened? Why did Kansas lawmakers seemingly give in to most of what Uber wanted in a new compromise bill now heading to the governor's desk that brings Uber back? Well, they kind of, my read on it was they more or less met uh, halfway, maybe one direction or the other, depending on how you look at it. Uh, the, Uber's kind of has this pattern of making a big show about the uh, onerous regulations that governments insist upon. And then they say, you know, we're going away and we're not coming back. But Uber's, I mean, Uber's business plan relies on being in as many places as they can. So it's never, I was never convinced that they were going to stay away for very long. Sure, the nice thing about being Uber is that you have no infrastructure, really, so you can shut down and start up again on a dime. And, you know, <laughs> that's what they do. Well, lawmakers also yeah. found time this week to debate a bill that would kill off the Kansas Bioscience Authority. Based in Olathe, the Kansas Bioscience Authority was created by lawmakers in 2004 as a way to recover a portion of taxes paid by bioscience companies in the state to help promote additional activity in the industry. They argue they help bring jobs to the Sunflower State. But if that's the case, why would lawmakers want to get rid of them? Isn't Governor Brownback desperate to show he's bringing in more jobs, Dave? Oh, no, he's desperate for revenue. Okay. <laughs> and his uh, colleagues in the legislature are, and the Kansas Bioscience Authority has long been a target. Sam Brownback has been a critic of that agency for almost as long as he's been in state government. Um, and so I think there may be some sense that maybe there's a way to capture some of this money or bring it back under the control, full control of the state of Kansas going forward. And, and, and we, we should recall, uh, recall that there was a bit of a scandal around the Bioscience Authority several years ago. Some of the money that it spent was probably not wisely spent by the executives over there. And that plays into this, too. Steve. And I think, I think Dave's right. I think if anybody couldn't really see this coming, the demise coming for the KBA, it should have been apparent when they picked a new CEO who didn't have a background in science, but rather a background in retail. And it's pretty obvious that uh, the KBA has been on a chart to, uh, of where it's going for, for quite a while. Well, well, certainly the Chamber of Commerce was horrified. They were sending their leadership to Topeka this week. But why does mm -hmm. the public care about this? <laughs> Um, maybe they don't. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, said someone said in Topeka this week, um, you know, that the Kansas legislature has a problem with authorities. Yes. Um, they got rid of the Turnpike Authority. They got rid of the Health Policy Authority. They, they want to sweep everything in and have control of it. We're talking about authorities. Kansas recently made national news, as Dave pointed out earlier, about welfare cracking down in the state, passing a law saying no one on public subsidies as part of that could withdraw more than $25 at a time on their ATM benefits cards. Now with the federal government threatening $102 million in funding, saying it violates federal welfare rules, lawmakers are backtracking. 
Why does the state don't care about those federal funds they would lose? They don't care about the funds they're losing by not expanding Medicaid. Why not let principal stand before cash on this issue? Because if you lost the $100 million for TANF in Kansas, it would eliminate welfare. You, and there are about... But the, Medicaid difference. expansion, you're looking at a lot more money. No, money well, than I mean, million. you don't have to convince the people around this table. We've all talked about <laughs> okay. Medicaid expansion for some time. But in this case, it's actual yes. money coming to the state of Kansas. $100 million serving between 15 and 17, 18,000 people who, who need assistance. And it, for the people who get welfare, Nick, we, we should be clear, it is important money. Now, it's not a lot of money. It's like for a family of three, it's about $500 a month in Kansas. That's not an enormous sum. It's even it's far less than that in Missouri, as you'll see in this story. But it is a lifeline for some people, and to just kiss that $100 million away is unpalatable, even for legislators, it seems, in the state of Kansas. And finally, it is a big weekend in Kansas City, and the Royals are not the only game in town. The NFL is in town three months early, thanks to Union Station's blockbuster new exhibit opening today, Gridiron Glory. The city honors its veterans Sunday at celebration at the station. It's a free concert with the symphony and fireworks. We broadcast the event live at 8. Also a replica of the Vietnam Veterans Wall in town throughout the weekend on the grounds of Liberty Memorial. And over at the zoo, get ready to go ape as the new $6 million orangutan canopy exhibit opens. The zoo's six forest apes have been living in a cramped steel cage exhibit, never knowing the feel of grass or perching high in a tree. All that now changes this weekend, the money mainly coming from the zoo tax passed in 2011 by Jackson and Clay County voters. Barbara, is the zoo becoming one of our biggest success stories now in Kansas City after in really so many years of people complaining about it? It's a great turnaround story. Dave? Uh, good riddance to the great ape house, which was an embarrassment to this community for decades. It was really, really sad to, to see the animals in that, in that uh, display case. Okay, so lots to do this weekend, and our thanks to our weekend reviewers from the editorial board of your Kansas City star, Barbara Shelley and Eric Weston of The Call, from the pitch, Steve Alcrot, and the stars, Dave Helling. I'm Nick Haynes. Have a great Memorial Day weekend.